uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I know that we are the last one, the only one between you and all your cocktails. And it must be uh, after a long and exhausting day after such a lot of information. So we try to keep it short and hopefully still interesting. We will talk about the CISRV mining botnet and in the first half of the presentation and on the, in the second half how to reverse Golang binaries using uh, Ghidra. And just a few words about who we are. So we both work at Kujo AI. I mainly studied mathematics and cryptography and somehow just reverse engineering swooped me in because it's like solving puzzles so I really enjoy doing uh, these kind of things and basically I just stuck there. Uh, and uh, also I would like to thank uh, Albert Zhigovic's work who was, uh, who was helping us in the research in the beginning. And now I will give the floor to Yuri. He will start the presentation and then I will continue. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so I'm Jörg Luptak and I'm a junior threat researcher at Kuju AI. I started that last uh, se September and um, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science and I'm currently pursuing a master's in computer science and IT security at a local university in Hungary, Budapest. Yeah, so a little background about why we did this research. So we at uh, the Threat Intel team at Kujo AI are focusing mainly on IoT and Linux malware research, uh, mainly because um, uh, Unix-like operation systems uh, nowadays can be as promising target as a Windows endpoint because there are even increasing uh, number of servers that use some Unix-like operation system because it's reliability and uh, operability. And also there are a lot of IoT devices that uh, run some Unix-like operation system. And these especially have uh, some serious security flaws that can be easily exploited. So CSRV is a botnet that targets also Linux and Windows uh, servers. And uh, it was written in the Golang or Go language, which, uh, and there are an increasing number of malwares written in this language, uh, mainly because it supports cross-compiling, so you have to maintain only one code base to get a binary that runs on uh, Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. But as we found, reverse engineering Go binaries can be really challenging. Uh, some reasons for this uh, is that uh, Golang uses uh, static linking in its uh, compiling process by default, which results in a huge file size and, and a lot of functions do, to go through when you analyze a Go binary. It handles strings in a unique way uh, that differs from like uh, C language. And uh, there are the general problem of strip binaries when there are no debug symbols to use for reverse engineering. For, for this research, we use Ghidra which is due to its early stage in open source development, uh, only covers part of these problems. So the goal of the research was to understand uh, how the CSRV botnet evolved over time, and in the process, uh, making reverse engineering Go binaries with Ghidra easier. Uh, the latter one resulted in several scripts uh, that solved some of the issues uh, that you can find in this GitHub repo. This is our agenda for today's presentation that Dorka already mentioned. Uh, I will begin by uh, introducing the CSRV botnet and going through its uh, main parts, the downloader script, the malicious binary, and the miner itself with the exploits that uh, the CSRV implements to infect other systems. And also because CSRV is also a crypto miner, uh, we are looking into its mining operation and its monetization scheme. Then Dorka will talk about how we analyzed uh, the CSRV botnet and how we solved uh, some of the issues that I just mentioned. So the CSRV botnet was first mentioned in December 2020 by multiple sources, first by Intezer, then by other blogs also. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a worm and a cryptocurrency miner, and it stood out due to its use of the Golang language, which is relatively new. Uh, language. Yeah. 
The botnet is distributed for both Linux and Windows environments, but we are only focusing on the Linux ones. And the botnet is still active today. As you can see on the image, the last uh, binary that we analyzed was submitted to VirusTotal on the 19th of April 2022. And uh, although it's not a relatively new botnet, because as you can see, it was first mentioned in two years ago, now only four antivirus products can detect it as malicious out of 60. Uh, first, I want to talk about the downloader script. So it is called ldr.sh for the Linux and ldr.ps1 for the Windows versions. And we divided the um, process of the development <coughs> of the downloader script to three parts. Um, at the beginning of each part, uh, some major changes was made to the script compared to the previous version. So the first version included only a hard-coded C2 server IP address and CSRV version, and only curl and we get uh, Unix commands to download the binary itself, a different one for uh, 32 and 64-bit systems. Then in just a few iterations, it quickly introduced some more advanced features like killing other minor uh, processes and Docker images too, and uh, in general processes with a high CP usage. It also removed or disabled some uh, system security services and uh, implemented some Chrome-based persistence. Then in the second start, uh, at the end of February 2021, we saw that uh, the script reverted back to a more simple version, uh, just uh, downloading b binary itself. And from there, a more slow-paced expansion was um, began, uh, which included some reintroduction of the lost parts of the script, but the developers also added some new ones, like uh, a randomized CSRV version, or installing cron if it's, uh, it is not existing on the system, uh, killing processes listening on specific ports that the CSRV itself wanted to use later on, and also spreading via SSH uh, with collected information like uh, host names uh, and key pairs uh, to spread uh, itself, yeah. One interesting part of the, the second part was, um, as I mentioned, it killed other mining processes as well. And this included a process named uh, KFRED DI, which uh, mimics a uh, legit Unix process, uh, kernel process named KFRED D. Uh, but later, uh, it looked like that it used as its own crypto miner process because um, it, uh, the script only downloaded the current CSRV version if uh, the KFRED DI process was not found running on the system. And the script also included a rewritten uh, top Unix command uh, that excluded uh, KFRED DI from its result list. Uh, but anyway, uh, later mm -hmm. we saw that the KFRED DI process was renamed by a similar one called KFRED DK. Uh, in the beginning of this year, um, we saw another batch of changes made to the script. Uh, the script itself builds onto the previous version, but it now includes some low-level custom curl or VGET-like code, and also it uh, also downloads a second script that you can see on the slide, that also helps um, the persistence of the CSRV by, uh, in an infinite loop, it uh, kills other mining processes, and if the HESB process, crypto miner process, is not found running on the system, it downloads the downloader script and executes it. Now turning our focus on the binaries itself, as I mentioned, there are separate ones for 32 and 64-bit uh, architectures, and we analyze more than 100 uh, ELF binaries. A fundamental part of the research was uh, trying to sort or organize uh, the different samples into uh, different groups by specific characteristics. For this, we decided to use the binaries package structures. As you can see in Go programs, um, so Go programs are organized into packages, and the package is a collection of source files in the same directory that all compile together, and functions, types, variables, and constants defined in one source file are visible to all other source files within the same package. For this, uh, we used a tool called Redress, uh, which is a utility for analyzing stripped Go binaries. On the 
image on the left, you can see the package structure of the, uh, of that most of the samples, uh, CSRV samples used. So most of the samples was packed by U vanilla UPX, and we did not see any other um, packer used by the malware developers. And the first samples mm -hmm. was not using any obfuscation at all. Uh, the first obfuscated sample appeared at the end of March 2021 and used the known Go utility called Go Obfuscate. First, they only obfuscated package names, as you can see on the image in the middle. And for the later samples, uh, some of the function names whose goal was to try to execute uh, the different exploits that the binary uh, implemented. So this was obfuscated. But uh, fortunately, as you can see on the comparison between the, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So as you can see by the comparison of the obfuscated and the not obfuscated function names, uh, this not presented a difficulty for us because they, this can be easily correlated to each other. Uh, the CSRV botnet is primarily targeting Linux and Windows servers and not IoT devices. The initial campaigns and versions included only a small set of exploits, but uh, as time went on, it incorporated a lot more of them. And interestingly, uh, some specific exploits in itself underwent several development stages where we saw that uh, the developers updated some functions until they reached a satisfying result or uh, simply got rid of that exploit. That's why, as you can see, um, some of the used exploits were only present in one or two samples or two versions, and uh, while others remained in the code base for a very long time. Uh, you can see also some of the latest exploits uh, used by the CSRV botnet, and as you can see, sometimes the time frame between the publication of uh, exploit and its usage in CSRV is only two months. Uh, this is a complete list of the vulnerabilities exploited by the CSRV botnet in some version of it. Uh, as you can see, it attacks a whole variety of services and all of the vulnerabilities exploited are belonging to the command injection category and none of them uh, exploits a memory vulnerability or memory corruption vulnerability. Now onto the miner itself. Uh, CSRV mines the Monero cryptocurrency uh, because uh, it's a tempting choice for mother developers because um, uh, its transactions are harder to trace and it can uh, use the CP of the or of an ordinary system. It uses the open source XM rig project to mine Monero, which can be found on GitHub. And, uh, but the configuration files of each version of the CSRV botnet slightly differs from each other. Uh, the mining address was the following for uh, all but one of the samples. And uh, the following mining pools was used. Uh, mining summer F2 pool, nano pool, and later a specific IP address and port combination that I will talk about later on. In this slide, you can see how the mining operation changed over time. So at the beginning in December 2020, the miner was embedded, embedded uh, as a JZIP compress file, uh, which once uh, with the it was uh, embedded with the Go bin data package or uh, library. And once extracted to the temp folder, it was named uh, uh, like network 01 and executed like that. Um, at the start, it only used one mining pool, the mine XMR one. Then later on, we saw that the miner was moved into the separate file as, and it was executed by the uh, downloader script. And it also added a second uh, mining pool, the F2 pool. In February 2021, the miner was once again embedded as a JZIP and it added a third pool, the nano pool. And uh, later on, it was embedded in as ELF file. And there was a single sample that uh, used a different mining address that differed from the uh, other one that I just showed you on the previous slide. And this uh, Monero address was tied to uh, watchdog cam uh, campaigns. 
from July 2021, um, the access uh, to a mining pool was done through a proxy. Uh, so this is done via the specific IP address and port combination that you can see on the slide. Uh, I have to mention that this IP address was used as uh, uh, the malware distribution IP address was the same, yeah. We also looked inside the monetization scheme to see how lucrative, uh, how much lucrative for it was it for the threat actors. Uh, and we simply looked inside the different pools that uh, I just uh, talked about. So the F2 pool uh, wallet account start, was started in November 2020. And uh, on the top image, you can see a total paid amount of XMR of 15, which is around 4,000 US dollars. Uh, but this XMR mining pool was closed one year later in November 2021. Uh, and the image uh, shown is from September 2021. The mining XMR account uh, was suspended uh, because of botnet activity. And the nano pool shows a total paid XMR of 76, which is around uh, 20,000 US dollars. And the first payment was conducted on the end of February 2021, and the last, uh, the beginning of July. From there, as I mentioned, um, the mining pool was, uh, so the communication to the mining pool was done through a proxy, and we couldn't follow that and um, see any gains from this part. And now I will turn it over to Dorka. So as you can see from uh, Yuri's uh, part, CSRV is not as a high scale botnet that we have heard about today. So it didn't gain that much money. We don't, probably most of you never even heard about it. So why are we still talking about why is it interesting? So. As Yuri already said, for us, the primary reason was that we could use it very well in our uh, Golang binary analysis. So in the rest of the time, I would like to show you uh, how, what kind of uh, scripts we created for uh, Go binary analysis and uh, how you could use it in your work if you need it. Uh, we primarily use uh, Ghidra, so all the scripts and everything that I will show will uh, be shown in uh, Ghidra. Uh, I don't really want to take much time about talking about Go. I'm sure that all of uh, you know uh, Go. It's a, a current version is uh, 1.18. Uh, during our research, most of the malware families that we have analyzed uh, use older versions, and uh, many of uh, the problems that you will see here are uh, related to older versions of Go, and it changed a little bit uh, during the last few versions, but I will uh, talk a little bit about that as well. Well, uh, so this uh, programming language is getting more and more, fo more popular amongst devel developers, but not just the general developers, but also uh, malware developers. So this is what we observed, and this is how we started to uh, look into the reverse engineering aspects of uh, Golang. Uh, it is very simple, easy to start to uh, write programs with, uh, using Go, uh, and as uh, we already mentioned, one of the best uh, functionality for malware developers is the cross-compiling functionality, so they don't have to create different uh, code base for each, like for Linux and Windows, but they can just uh, use one and compile it separately. So let's uh, jump into the, like the very basics, and then I will show uh, some uh, code from uh, the CSRV botnet. Uh, so the First uh, pro problem with Go binary is that they are huge. So they are statically linked uh, by default, uh, and that's why we get uh, huge uh, executable images. Uh, there are very uh, many drawbacks of it. Of course, the malware distribution can be more difficult, or, and also for us, the reverse engineering can be more difficult. Just uh, for a comparison, uh, these are the uh, simple Hello World programs written in C and Go. And as you can see in uh, the C version, it's uh, like 16 kilobytes, while in Go it's two megabytes. And uh, since uh, we are talking about uh, malware, usually we are uh, handling stripped uh, binaries, which means that uh, 
we cannot see nice uh, function names. Uh, the, uh, these are all uh, uh, discarded. Of course, the uh, size will be reduced, but uh, the reverse engineering can be uh, harder since we don't see nice shiny function names or only uh, some general uh, naming uh, conventions. And uh, if we look at the same example again, in the stripped version of the hello world, we can see that the Go uh, binary is still quite large. So what does it mean if we look at a real world uh, example for uh, the rest of the presentation, mainly I will use uh, one of the latest uh, CSRV uh, binaries. Uh, here is the hash and also, so if anyone is interested or want, you want to dive a little bit deeper into this kind of reverse engineering, then you can just uh, simply use this file and follow the steps uh, on the slides. Uh, and uh, as uh, Yuri mentioned, these are usually UP expects, so this is here the unpacked version, which is, as you can see, is huge, like 12 megabytes. And uh, this is how uh, it looks like when we look at the functions in, in Ghidra. So there are like almost 9,000 different functions uh, without proper function names. So how, how do we start? So we would like to find something interesting. We would like to figure out what this uh, binary is doing, what kind of uh, malware it is. Uh, this is not really a helpful place to start, like to look at the function names, but uh, luckily, with uh, Go binaries, there is hope for it. So, uh, if, for example, if we uh, use redress that we already uh, mentioned before, uh, it will show you all the uh, different packages that were used in the same stripped Go binary, and uh, also we can find some function names. So. If we, for example, want, uh, we know that there should be uh, main.main, uh, function, then we just simply uh, look for this string within the binary. And uh, once we find the main dot main, this is our lucky time, even in the stripped uh, version, the string is still there. That's a good start. So what can we do now? Uh, the first thing is to figure out where this string is located. So we open up the memory map and we uh, look at the section names. I hope you can see it, but if not then basically there is a specific uh, section called go PCL and tab and this is where we just simply find a string that we expect to be a function name. So this is a very good start, it is very promising. So what we can do next is try to figure out what is going on in this go PCL and tab and uh, there is a very nice clear documentation about the uh, PCL and tab structure. It usually starts with uh, it always starts with a magic value, and then uh, the instruction size went to a pointer size, and then there is a, there are there is a list of function addresses followed by function metadata pointers. So it means that there is uh, uh, for each function we can find its address within the code, and then there is a pointer to the to a so-called metadata table, which I will explain shortly what it is exactly. So. Just a, a quick side note, uh, during this presentation we are focusing on Linux binaries, uh, but it's very, very similar in Windows. Uh, in Windows we won't find PCL and tab uh, section or go PCL and tab, but the structure, since it's very clear, it's well documented, we know what to expect, we can just simply look for the magic value and what other values we would expect after that. And that's it, this is how we can uh, find uh, this uh, structure like very easily as in Linux. So once uh, we fi find the function addresses, then we will fi uh, then we can also uh, fo uh, follow the pointers and look at the function metadata tables. In these tables are uh, several useful information regarding the the functions. And uh, if we look closely, the first entry is basically again the address of the function, and the second one is an offset to the function name. So that's, that's also very promising. And uh, uh, yes, before I move on, so this is what we really need to, to build back up and have a better list where we can actually read the functions and have some idea, function names and have some idea what is going on there. So before I move forward, I have to mention that it is changed a little bit in the latest uh, Go versions. So everything is still there, but uh, the, uh, for example, the function name offset is moved a little bit different place. It's uh, just uh, 
takes a few lines in a script and then it can be solved easily, but we have to take into consideration. So that's the thing with Go, we have to keep up with the changes all the time and adjust our, our script to these. And, but it's uh, very easy, the documentation for Go is, is, is super clear, so we can just follow, uh, find these magic uh, values, and based on that we will know which route to take, how we will find the necessary information, like the function name. But I won't go into the details of this at the moment. So here uh, is a, an actual example uh, from the same uh, file that I showed earlier. So if someone wants to do some reverse engineering hands-on, actually sit down and do it, you can just follow these uh, steps. So first we need to locate the pc -Lent abstracture. In Linux it's very easy, we just find this section. And then uh, one by one we can extract the function addresses and then the function name, find the function name offsets. So for example here uh, you can, oh I'm so sorry. Here you can uh, see the uh, function uh, address with the red uh, part, and then uh, underneath is the metadata uh, table pointer, and if you follow that, then there is again the address of a function, so this is the, our function that we are looking at, and then the offset of the function name. And if we just calculate this and follow, we will see that there is main.main. So this is very easy steps, and this is what our script is doing. If we execute the script, then it will find the name of every single function and just rename it, and now it's, if you look at it, it looks much nicer than looking at all these uh, fun functions. So on the right side, you can see that now it's almost 7,000 different functions are identified, so it even helped in that one. But uh, now we can actually focus on the interesting ones. Of course, we can get rid of all the Go uh, stuff that we don't need. Uh, and like here, main.main, .main, but if you look a little bit up, then there are these exploit functions. And when you do reverse engineering, it's much easier. Like you can go through the function names and just find what is interesting and start uh, your research uh, or analysis there. Uh, and uh, so this is the function part and now, uh, I would like to move on uh, to the part of uh, analyzing strings or recovering strings within uh, binary binaries. So in Ghidra, uh, there is a so-called defined strings window where you can uh, see all the strings that you that uh, Ghidra found within the binary. So, for example, it's also a good start. You have no idea what this malware is doing and you're just browsing through the strings and um, try to find some clue what to do and how to start it. Uh, the problem here is that we have almost 21,000 strings, so good luck with browsing through and find interesting stuff, but th that's the problem of Go. And the other problem is that do we, do, does it include everything that we actually need? So as, uh, for example, previously you heard from uh, Yuri, there, are, there is this specific mining pool URLs and the URL, and if we try to look for it in the defined strings window, we just simply cannot find it. Okay, maybe that it's not even in the binary, but it is. If we look at with like a simple strings command, we can find this specific string. So what's the problem is here? What, what the problem is here? There is a string we can, which we can just simply look at, looking at the binary, grabbing for this we can find. But when we look into Ghidra, we look at the defined strings window, we have 20,000 strings and we still don't find the one that we are looking for. And the answer is that Go is handling strings or defining strings in a very different way, way than C. So in C, uh, uh, strings are a sequence of characters and terminated with a null character. But in Go, it's different. It, there is a specific structure called a string structure, so there is, which consists of two things. First of all, there is a pointer, which points to the beginning of the string, and then there is an integer which will uh, show you the length of the string. And there is no null termination. In fact, in many cases, these, string, these small strings are concatenated together and just stored as a large string block be, be within the bi binary. So there is no easy way to differentiate where one string ends and the other one starts. It's not like zero, uh, zero bytes between them. So uh, that's why Ghidra also has a hard time to define uh, these uh, string within, strings within Go binaries. 
Uh, and uh, what our script is doing here is uh, we try to find, uh, try to help uh, Ghidra to find these uh, structures. These structures can be created in many different ways. They can be allocated dynamically or statically. It is different for architecture. There are different solutions within architectures. And uh, as you will see, it can change over Go versions as well. But uh, there, with, one, uh, with a couple of uh, solutions, we've managed to uh, create scripts that recover the strings that we need in like 98% of the time when we were analyzing different malware families written in Go. So let's start with the dynamically allocated string structure. Uh, this means that uh, this uh, string tru structure is created runtime. There are different uh, scenarios based on the architecture. Now we are looking into one uh, specific uh, function of CSRV. This is the uh, XML run uh, function of the minor functionality. And uh, if we look a little bit uh, closer, then we will see that before this call to the string to slice byte uh, function, then, then uh, there is a uh, an address placed to, into the register, then moved onto the stack, and uh, then there is a number, basically the length moved onto the stack as well. And if we f follow the address, we will see that there is some kind of uh, string there. So uh, the idea here is to create these uh, sequence of instructions and uh, just to tell Ghidra, just look for these sequences, and if you find this, uh, this sequence, then you will know which one, where, what is the string address and what is the length of the, that specific string, and you can just uh, define uh, easily the string that you find there. Here uh, you can uh, see the uh, same example. Uh, it's almost the same for 32 and um, uh, 64 uh, bit uh, versions. And, um, this is what happens after we execute the script and the strings are defined. So first of all, in the code, now you can see a string that's just a, like a reference to an address, but the, an actual string which will help to read the code in many cases. So for example, if it's a ransomware, then you will see that there is the name of the ransom note or something like that. So it's much easier to actually look at the code and like simply read it like from a from a like like a source code or something almost because there are these strings that help and also if you full, now you now you know that there is an address and if you followed you will see that there is a, a huge uh, string over there which is um, uh, in a, it, it helps in it uh, the uh, part of the config file of the uh, miner and uh, after this uh, uh, string was created, now we can uh, look at the defined strings window, search for the string that we were searching before, and now it's there. So basically this uh, URL is within the configuration file of the mi miner, and now that we created this string, it's much uh, easier to to look uh, to look for. So and now we have much more uh, strings that we had uh, before. Uh, and um, as I said, the problem is with different instruction sets. I didn't want to go into details about uh, these today uh, to keep it uh, fairly short, but you can find uh, some documentation about it on our uh, blog and also in our script. So for example, how to, what is instruction sequence we use for RM or this uh, kind of thing, and it's also a work in progress, so we are adding more and more as we, as we need those. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, it's something that's uh, very easy to break. So it's a sequence that if it's in the other way around or something, then it, uh, it, it can be broken easily. But, uh, but as I already mentioned, in most of the time, in most of the cases, it's, it's just simply working. And when we find something that is coming up frequently and we should take into consideration, it's very easy to just to add it, add it to our script and then next time we will find uh, that as well. Uh, and uh, as a last example, I would like to go through the statically allocated string structure. So uh, here what we do uh, is uh, we look for uh, the pointers followed by the possible string values. So it's basically a list of uh, addresses followed by uh, integers, address integers, so something like this. And we, it, it's easier to uh, create false positives, so we limit the length, string lengths and also only search for printable characters. But if uh, 
someone is using these for their own purposes, it's uh, fairly easy just to change these according to your needs because the string can be much larger or you look for some specific character so you can change the character set as well. And uh, we only check it in data sections and uh, luckily it's not uh, architecture specific. And uh, one fun fact about this one, it actually works with uh, Rust samples as well. So that was just something that we gained with, uh, with this uh, script. So in this example, the, there is one pointer already defined because it is uh, directly referenced from the code. But after that, we see that these look like as integers followed by addresses, but we don't really know what it is. Uh, but if, uh, for example, we follow these addresses, then we will see that there are strings that are not defined, but still there is something that is clearly visible. We can human readable, so it would be nice if uh, it would be uh, defined and we could uh, read it and use it in our research uh, or analysis. So what happens after we execute the script? Uh, all the addresses will be created, I aim mean, all the pro pointers, and these all no, this all named very nicely, so you can see that there is some string there, like root, root, a, a, one, two, three, four, five, six, and also the integers will be created, so how long is the string that we expect to, to see there. And uh, so, for example, and also the strings will be defined that were not before. Uh, so for here, when we look at this, for example, like this is um, one of the exploit functions, then coming here and instead of only seeing this, like basically nothing, we will see this. And it already helps to figure out that pro probably some brute forcing will go on here, like a list of uh, usernames and passwords. Uh, and uh, a few words about what kind of uh, challenges we had with the string rec recovery. Uh, one of them is when Ghidra is uh, defining, falsely defining uh, data types. So for, in many cases it happens that we uh, want to create a data type but something is already there. Uh, most of the cases the problem was that there is the so-called uh, so undefined data type already there, which is actually a defined data type. So to solve this problem here uh, in this example, this is uh, from the minor, one of the minor functions, uh, where they kill the old version, uh, it, and if we uh, run simply our script, then it, it uh, won't create the strings here because instead of the integer, there is already something there and they, the data type just simply cannot be created. So what we do here is just remove these undefined data types when we suspect that we need something uh, meaningful there and then uh, 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 just change it to an integer at the, the address here, and it will show to the, it will point to the uh, string which will be defined, created, and again, we can read the code uh, much easier. Uh, and uh, the last one is when uh, the, uh, as I already mentioned, it happens that these smaller strings are concatenated and the large string uh, blob is uh, stored within the binary. This is how Go uh, handles strings. And sometimes if there is a, a null byte, then uh, Ghidra will uh, define this a lot of smaller str strings as one huge string. So when you want to create your, the pieces of the strings, you won't be able because there is already a huge uh, string. Uh, so usually before we run, run and execute our script, script uh, what we do is uh, looking into the defined strings window and uh, find those uh, strings where the offcut reference is count is high. This means that there are uh, from the code reference different uh, parts of this string, so not the beginning, but other uh, parts of this huge string, which probably means that it was falsely identified. So we simply get rid of the, this uh, string, undefined uh, it, and then run our script so they can be, uh, they can be uh, executed properly. So uh, before uh, I uh, conclude, there, <coughs> is uh, our other work, which we didn't include, because they don't want it to be too long, where we uh, work on uh, to identify different types of uh, 
within the Go binary, so that will be much uh, easier to read, but everything will be uploaded to our GitHub and uh, most of the scripts are already there. You can use it freely if you uh, happen to bump into a Go uh, binary and you need to uh, analyze it. Uh, also, there are hundreds of other researchers work, uh, not uh, specifically for Ghidra, but other tools like IDA or other tools, uh, which are like perfect and excellent. We were focusing on uh, Ghidra, but if you use something else, then there are tons of poss possibilities to use those. Uh, and also, like, uh, there are some references to which we included here, like about deep botnet and uh, many of those about how to analyze uh, Golang uh, binaries. And uh, with this, I, I would conclude our talk for today. Thank you for your attention. And uh, you can find uh, us here on Twitter. Here is our GitHub repository. So feel free to use our scripts. And also, we will upload all the IOCs regarding the botnet. So. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the evening. Okay, we, we have some time for questions um, because the, the beers won't be available before 6.30, so uh, be quiet. Come on, guys, girls. I have a question. <laughs> uh, are you willing to, to make a, a workshop for, an, for next year? Because yeah. the, this would fit into a workshop, like uh, spending some time with people, explaining them for uh, three or four hours and go in detail and uh, would be nice. Yeah, yeah, we were actually considering it to creating uh, Basically, we have everything for it, like tools and uh, all the... So, so yes, why not? That, that, mm, that could work. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah. So, uh, during your analysis, did you have any problems with functions not getting recognized, and does your tool do anything with that? Uh, yeah, so as I've shown before, there, like, I, I feel, I go back, I think. So here, just a second, where is this? Yeah, so we have like 3,800 functions recognized, and when we execute our uh, script, it will be 6,900. So it's uh, something not like we deliberately did it, but uh, since we are just uh, finding the addresses and the names and then we add the command to actually create the functions, then yes, this will automatically create all these missing functions. Hey, um Obviously, I'm not uh, like closely familiar with with the Golang internals, but um, I'm just curious. Like, if you strip down the binary, why does it leave the function name information? Is that required somehow by the runtime, or um, is that um, something that can be, let's say, removed later by some you know, um, additional uh, protector or obfuscator to obscure, you know, the analysis even further? Yeah. So that's that's a very good question. Actually, I was trying to read really hard after it how to like to create something without these function names or but uh, I, I cannot really answer exactly why they need it or keep it the only thing I know that there is a, like a long going discussion of getting rid of these but they are still there so yeah I, I try to find somewhere where, it, where there are no function names but I couldn't so it's for some reason, which I cannot really explain, explain if they, they are there. I think I can try to elaborate on that. Uh, why they are not stripped probably is because the stripping tool is using different section in ELF binaries. But the question is actually, if you remove the strings manually, will the Go binary still running? So let's say you just you know, remove the, the, the function name strings like 
have a buy accelerator or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I've never tried, but I will. <laughs> I will. Uh, also, did you try to using uh, this? Fan I, I'm, I'm an IDA pro guy for life, uh, but Gidra has this fancy language, interme intermediate language, right? Uh, did you try using it for the pattern matching? Uh, no. For okay. Other Golang questions? Are you sure? <laughs> okay, I'm. I'm go. Don't leave. <laughs> I'm going to make a short presentation. So, first, thank you. Thank you.